Guadalajara. Tienes el alma de provinciana, hueles a limpia rosa temprana. Ave de paro, fuente de río, son tus palomas mi caserío. Guadalajara, Guadalajara, hueles a pura tierra mojada. Welcome to Mexican Madness, an exploration of Mexican and Southwestern cookery, interpreted by some of the great chefs of America. From New York City, Zarella Martinez, Bobby Flay and Lynn Aronson, Mark Holliger from New Orleans, and from Washington, D.C., Mark Miller. Mark Miller's Red Sage Restaurant in the nation's capital has been the talk of that very talkative town since it opened in 1992. A visit from President and Mrs. Clinton didn't hurt. But Chef Miller's cooking does not need celebrity hype. An example is his lamb loin and Pueblo flatbread. It begins with preparation of the bread. Two cups of all-purpose flour. Add our dry ingredients first. A tablespoon of sugar. A tablespoon of salt. And one teaspoon of baking powder. This is a very simple mixture and it's an all-purpose bread. You can uh, fry it, you can bake it, you can use it as a pizza bottom. It's a real uh, popular bread here at the restaurant. Now we're going to add our wet ingredients. We're going to chop up, before we add our milk, we're going to chop up our herbs a little bit more. They're a little bit too big. Okay. So here we have our sage, our chive, and our fresh marjoram. Okay. That's good enough. We don't want to get the herbs too fine, but we also want them to distribute evenly throughout the dried ingredients to distribute the flavor. Okay. So we've got our dried herbs, our fresh herbs. It's also, if you use dried herbs in this recipe, um, they tend to burn and not give you the flavor that you need. So really use some fresh herbs, even if you just have to use like fresh parsley and one other herb. The sage is the most important one. Okay. We're going to add our wet ingredients, our one cup of milk. We're going to put that together. We've put our dough together, and we're going to get a nice bowl that's uh, not too dry again, not too, and not too soft. So get our herbs now. You can cover this in plastic and put it in the refrigerator and make this a day ahead of time. It, it holds perfectly well. You can use it, roll it out for a pizza dough. So we're going to lightly roll this out on a floured surface. A trimmed loin of lamb is used, flavored with the southwestern dry rub. We're going to flavor this with a dried rub, which has mostly chilies, also anise seed, dried coriander, fresh thyme, dried oregano, and a hot chili, a little bit of black pepper, and some salt. And we're just going to roll that in our dry marinade, give the loin a little bit more flavor, and a little crust, and seal in those juices. Again, a light coat. You could put some sage in here, but I, I like a mixture of sage or, or thyme, certainly. It gives you some of those deserty tones. We're going to take our loin. Now, you want to have the loin um, cold. If you have the loin at room temperature and you dry sear it, it'll start cooking too much. So that by the time we wrap it with our dough, we'll end up with a medium or medium well loin. So it's important that you have your loin cool or cold to do the dry searing. And again, we don't want to cook this till it's black, and we just want to cook it about a minute, a minute and a half on each side. And here we're going to cook just the two sides, not the sides. All right, we're going to take the lamb loin off, give it a little bit of crust. There we go. You can also use a venison loin for this. You can also use a um, pork loin or a veal loin for this dish. It's a really, really nice centerpiece. This is um, one of the dishes that we use for Valentine's Day when the president and Mrs. Clinton came for dinner. Red Sage. Here we've got our Pueblo bread rolled out with the fresh herbs in it. We can stretch it out a little bit. Want to get it about a quarter of an inch thin. Want to take off most of the flour after we've rolled it out off the surfaces. We don't need that. So I've made a mixture of spicy black bean that's been pureed with fresh mint. The black bean spread is also flavored with roasted cumin seed, roasted oregano, and chipotle chili sauce. Okay. 
Next thing we're going to do is we're going to take our loin and we're going to cover it with some blanched mustard greens, which we've blanched off in a little bit of salted water and then cooled off. The, the bigger mustard greens, we're going to pull out part of that center stem that's a little bit tough. Put the mustard greens down. We'll put our loin of lamb on top. And then we're going to, again, pull out those big center stems and put enough mustard greens around in order to fully encase the whole loin. The greens are a little bit wet, so I'm going to put them, make sure that they're dry, because otherwise you won't get a nice crusty lamb. Put that last green down, and we're going to just pick up some of that excess moisture here in our greens, because we don't want our pastry to be soggy inside. Okay. Bring that up. Bring those over. We've got a little mustard green package. The last ingredient that we're going to add is goat cheese. And the goat cheese, uh, you can use an unflavored goat cheese, either domestic. I think a lot of the Americans really make great goat cheeses now. This is a goat cheese from California. We also have uh, goat cheeses from New Mexico, upper state New York. And you want to put a fairly thick coat of the goat cheese, because of course the goat cheese is going to melt. It's going to create that sort of tanginess and sort of coolingness against the bitterness of the mustard greens and some of the, of the chili. We're going to bring our sides up. And we're going to pinch our ends down. We're going to cut our ends off or not use them, so it's not important that we get that seam. The last thing we're going to do is we're going to use an egg wash, which is a whole egg mixed with a little bit of cream or milk to give it some color. Now we're going to put egg wash the bottom and the sides and the top. We're going to cook this in about a 450 degree oven. If you have a convection oven at home, it'll take a little less time. And if you have a, a regular oven, make sure that you get a hot oven. Otherwise, the bread will, won't color and the meat will cook too quickly. Turn that over. And we've got a lightly buttered sheet pan to bake this on. In a standard oven, bake the packet at 375 there degrees for 10 to 15 minutes. We're going to put this into our wood burning oven. This is an oven that was especially made for us that uses wood. We get some of that wood smoky tones. And this oven's burned very quickly and stay very hot. Vegetable for this dish is a ragu of roasted corn, blackened Roma tomatoes, and a melange of wild mushrooms and garlic sauteed in olive oil. Here we got our different kinds of wild mushrooms with our garlic. We've been sauteed. Get our morels, our black trumpets de morts, fresh chanterelles, a little bit of portobello. Mm. Nice woodsy flavors. We're going to add to that some blackened tomato. And we're going to add our dry roasted corn. Now at this point, all of our ingredients have already been cooked. Our tomatoes have been blackened. Our corn is already cooked. So we don't, we don't want to cook this too long because our corn will get too starchy. Get nice colors there. You know? And we're going to add a little bit of toasted Mexican wild oregano. We're going to add a little bit of our chipotle and adobo, again, our smoked chili sauce here. Gives us a little vinegar and a little bit more of that smoky tones and a little bit more chili flavor. We want to cook this only for about two to three minutes. The lamb loin will be served on a bed of this ragu. 
The lamb and flatbread is carved for service. Okay, we've got our two ends off. We're gonna cut it. You can either cut it in sections and lie it down. You could probably make about, um, if you wanna serve it as a smaller portions, you'd make a large one and then cut it across and lie it. Here, we're gonna cut it in a diagonal and do it sort of triangular so that it really looks pretty standing up on the plate. Okay, this is a serrated edge knife, which is a little bit easier. And if you can look at that, we've got our nice color of our lamb with our black bean and mustard greens and our goat cheese. Put that one, one pocket going one way and another pocket going the other way. A lamb stock based sauce flavored with a number of southwestern products and spiked with orange zest completes presentation. We're going to finish our dish with our strained stock with our flavor of the cinnamon. You can smell the cinnamon and the orange and the smoked chili and a little arbol jus. Lola in New York is anything but an ethnic restaurant. However, Chef Lynn Aronson's menu has a rainbow of influences. For example, she presents a taco with Japanese daikon radish sprouts and miso, as well as Chinese rice wine vinegar and star anise. It's called a tuna taco and begins by preparing the tuna for searing. So first I'm going to um, coat the tuna in some egg white so that the spice mix adheres evenly to the tuna. You, you want to lay it out flat so it does coat evenly. The spice mix is a combination of um, star anise, sesame seed, ground black pepper, and uh, coriander seed. I've already mixed salt into the spice mix. All of the spices are um, um, toasted and then ground in a, in a spice mill. You want to get your pan hot, but not too hot, so that you don't burn those spices, because they burn easily. You don't need very much oil. Just make sure your pan is evenly coated. It's only going to sear for probably about one minute on each side. Just until the tuna is uh, cooked about an eighth of an inch all the way around. You definitely need to keep a close eye on it. You might want to adjust the heat as you go along. So now it's, it's ready to be sliced and you can just Take it off the flame and hold it aside until you're ready to use. The taco shell that I'm using is a peppered papadum. You can buy it in any Indian market. They're extremely thin and they cook very, very quickly. <clears throat> it's predominantly made of chickpea flour. They're made in India outside and they're let they stay outside and they dry, and that's how they become so crisp. You can probably see how they bubble up. As soon as the entire shell is bubbled, you know it's done. It's very flexible at that point, and you can mold it with your hands to form the shape that you want it to be. This dish takes two vinaigrettes on the plate. One is made from whole cucumbers. <clears throat> so you have the cucumber in the blender. I'm adding some rice wine vinegar. The rice wine vinegar is a little sweet, 
canola oil. So it really makes a nice combination with the cucumber. These are daikon sprouts. They're also a component in the dish, so I think it's really nice to add them into this vinaigrette. All you really want to do is pulverize the cucumber until the oil and the rice wine vinegar come together. Seasoning is adjusted with salt. Daikon, a Japanese radish, is diced to begin the relish, which will garnish the tuna taco. The relish also contains cucumber. So this is the relish for the top of the, the tuna taco. I'm using a mandolin, but it certainly isn't necessary to do that. You can do this by hand if you don't have a mandolin at home. Once again, it's not necessary to remove the skin. The skin gives it really nice color and adds nice flavor. You want to make an even dice because it sits on top of the tuna. It's the first thing you see. So with that cucumber vinaigrette that was just prepared, the cucumber and the daikon get tossed in that. So now I'm going to slice the tuna, <clears throat> the tuna really thin, as thin as possible. If you try to go too thin, sometimes it crumbles. You want to use an extremely sharp knife. Presentation includes a miso vinaigrette containing miso paste, lime juice, canola oil, and rice vinegar. Miso paste is fermented soybeans that you can buy in any Japanese market. Also fresh baby spinach. I'm tossing the spinach and just a, lit, a combination of um, also the canola oil and some lime juice. relish on top of the tuna. Garnish with the sprout. The plate is finished with red curry oil and cilantro oil. In New Orleans, German bond chef Mark Holiger's Santa Fe restaurant trumpets the Mexican theme. Actually, Mexican food is one of the few ethnic categories not amalgamated in what is eponymously labeled Creole cooking. Chef Holiger offers the Mexican specialty fajita, but instead of skirt steak, he serves Louisiana seafood. We have a seafood fajitas here. You notice it nice. Louisiana, if you're lucky enough to live in, in Louisiana, you have the variation of it. Even that one, it doesn't, the green mussels does not come from that area, but I like to look assortment of uh, seafood, soft shell crawfish, 
We have the green mussels, we have soft shell crawfish meat, the tail. We have mussels, we have a monkfish. What you call it, monkfish is a, uh, the poor man's lobster. You can use any kind of firm fish, but that's uh, very good. Or oh, you can use lobster even. Uh, soft shell crab, we have frog legs. We do find some frog legs in the, some around here. We have a few little shrimps here. We have two oysters. Clarified butter is used in hot saute pans. And so we have to make sure it is very, very hot. Now, you, of course, you don't put the, the cooked ingredients in here. You put first in the ones that take a longer. There's the monkfish, the soft shell crab, and of course, we have a beautiful scallop. You don't get it from Louisiana, but that's better. You know, when you notice that the fish is wet, now if you put it in a hot skillet, of course the, comes, the flame comes up. You use a ballet knife, a long fork, so you don't burn yourself. Just move it over that fish, both sides. It doesn't take very long. It's a dish you can cook very fast at home. Be a, you feel like you're in Mexico when you cook that. Sliced onion and bell pepper are sautéed in the second skillet. You just put a little bit of butter in it, or margarine, and you cook the peppers. After it's cooked for a while, a few minutes, you put the rest of the seafood to it, and you add the mushroom to it. Best time, and the best thing is you're using definitely two skillet because it, otherwise it won't cook together. You add some few tomatoes to it, the rest of the vegetables, you let it cook nice. You have to put, see, I have using a seafood spice, I make it. Cape Horn seafood spice is very good too. But um, if you're using mine, I don't put salt and pepper to it because it's spicy enough. You can't put the seafood spice too early because otherwise it burns. Now I do put a little bit of salt and pepper to the veggie peppers to make a better taste to it. You mix it all together. Doesn't it look delicious? Now you put on a platter, you put our rice. Lovely, colorful rice. The Mexican, the Mexican saffron rice. You add beans to it. And we're using a brown gravy, any kind of brown gravy. Are we calling a paplano uh, sauce because we put paplano puree in there? And of course, we put a garnish on here, sour cream and guacamole. Flour tortillas are quickly heated. And uh, if you want to cook something like that, it takes a few minutes to cook it, you notice it. And don't tell me, you'd, when you have some Mexican music and some good margaritas or sangria, and you feel like in Mexico. A New York Times critic calls Zarella's arguably the best Mexican restaurant in the city. Zarella Martinez and Abullion Dynamo opened her operation in 1987, and the menu is vivid testament to a passion for her native food. Born in Sonora, she was raised on a ranch and learned cooking from her mother. Several of Zarella's menu items can be traced directly to this source, not uncommon in Mexican restaurants. She presents two dishes here, beginning with a seafood stew with coconut milk and a fiery salsa verde. Okay, so what we're going to be making is a salsa verde, and it's very simple. It's just a matter of putting everything in the food processor and doing it for one second. We have an onion, which is peeled and cut in a few pieces. 
We have five garlic cloves. Somebody came the other day and said, I, I want something with that garlic. I said, you got the wrong place. Some jalapeno chilies. This is a hot sauce. Eight fresh jalapenos. A little bit of oregano. Some a tablespoon of oregano. Some es la sal. A bit of salt. Not too much. This is not that. I, my food processor at home is better than this. Here we go. Put in a little bit of oil. Olive oil is good here, but you can use vegetable. Yeah, pagano. And that's the whole secret of this. So we have to put the, the cilantro in it. We got it. The salsa verde can be held covered and refrigerated for up to two weeks. Okay. I love the flavor. This always reminds me of the ranch, the smell of the mint. Another powerful flavor factor in the stew is chopped mint. Saute the salsa verde in butter to begin the stew. And this, this sauce is very hot. So you take a few spoonfuls. The salsa is cooked for about two minutes before the seafood is added. Put in the scallops. Salmon. And some peeled shrimp. So all of a sudden all that salsa doesn't look like it was all that salsa, huh? Some chopped mint. At this stage of the dish, stir constantly for two to three minutes. Some of the, some nice fish stock with this. And the coconut water. The coconut water was drained from a fresh coconut. A fourth of a cup of canned unsweetened coconut milk will substitute. This is simmered uncovered for another two to three minutes until the seafood is opaque. A few little shrimp, a little bit of sauce, a little more scallops, and you just clean the plate. Zarella's second offering is a chicken stew called Drunken Chicken. One of the flavorings is tequila. A saute pan is preheated with vegetable oil and seasoning for the chicken is prepared. We're gonna combine some flour, salt, and freshly ground pepper. Can always never have too, too much pepper. We're gonna dust this chicken in it. I got this recipe from this woman that used to have a still next to the ranch. And they used to make this recipe with uh, mezcal, but since we can't get that kind of sotol here, we're doing, uh, I do it with tequila. But I love it. The chicken pieces are browned on both sides over medium-high heat for about 10 minutes. And in the meantime, I'm going to be heating up some, um, some sherry. And plumping up some raisins, which we're going to heat up a little bit, and then we'll 
let it soak about 20 minutes. After the chicken is browned, cover and keep warm. Using the same pan, brown sliced onions. When I get every little piece of chicken there. Add the, some almonds, some slivered almonds. You can make them whole if you want. Depends on the look that you want. Like that you get a little bit toasted. I often use whole olives, but you can also use sliced ones if you'd like. Vas a tener que sacar más este. Then the plump raisins. The olives and the raisins and the almonds are another one of the trinities of Mexican food. They use very, very much. A cup of tequila is mixed with some cornstarch. So we're going to add now some chicken stock. And then some vinegar, some white vinegar. You might not like it as sour as I like it, but uh, Mexicans do like things sour. We are the people that eat chili with, uh, with lime. And this is a little bit of sugar because you want to bring out a little bit of the sugar. You don't really need to add salt because of the olives. The sauce is simmered for about 10 minutes or until it thickens. Take it like that. This is the at-home version of this recipe. Put it in the oven. Bake at 350 degrees for about 20 minutes. This can also be done on top of the stove. And there you go. Some pollo borracha. The Mesa Grill in Manhattan is serious about its southwestern theme. Executive chef Bobby Flay is the guiding hand behind it and in 1993 won the James Beard Foundation's Rising Star Award. His dish shows he may have already risen. It's shrimp and roasted garlic tamale, which starts with a cornmeal or masa stuffing. Okay, first I'm gonna make the masa. <clears throat> I'm gonna use some fresh corn. Some fresh chopped jalapenos. Chopped red onions. A little water or, or some chicken stock is fine also. And then totally puree this. Transfer this to a mixing bowl. I'm going to add some yellow cornmeal. Vegetable shortening. some butter. butter. 
salt and pepper. And mix this well. It takes a while to incorporate shortening in the butter to this. I'm going to take some soaked corn husks soaked in lukewarm water for about a half an hour. I'm going to take two and interlock them. Wrap the husk around it. And then I'm going to tie both ends. I'm just going to put them in a the steamer, let them steam for about 45 minutes. Next, garlic sauce. I'm going to sweat some onions, <clears throat> some roasted garlic. Sweat this for about five minutes. Then I'm going to add about uh, half a bottle of this white wine. I'm going to reduce down until it's dry. After the, after the white wine is reduced, add the cream. Let that simmer for about 10, 10 to 15 minutes. The ensuing mixture is processed. Just blend it all together. This is what she looked like. Reserve the sauce until service. These bluish shrimp are flown in from the far east. They are butterflied and will be right. sauteed quickly. Take the steamed tamale. I'm gonna cut one end. to spill out a little bit. This will set up our plate. One side, and when that's done, Add this roasted garlic sauce. Some fresh corn. Cilantro. Salt and pepper. Garnish with a little red pepper. Some more fresh lunch.
Mark Miller returns for another version of Tamale. During the 70s in San Francisco, he was at the epicenter of new American cooking. Now he calls it modern western, and when he deals with Mexican food, he is almost professorial, as you will see with his wild mushroom tamale. It too starts with the masa dough. We put in uh, two cups of dried masa, which is our flour that is the, um, from the dried corn that's been used in Mexico for several thousand years. Uh, water, about one half cup of warm water, a little bit of salt, about a half teaspoon, some sugar, sort of sweetens up the corn, and some baking powder, half teaspoon of baking powder. I'm going to add some um, dry roasted corn, that's fresh corn that's been dry roasted in a pan to give it a nice smoky flavor, to accentuate the more sort of country tones. A lot of the food was traditionally cooked on open fires or in wood-burning ovens, so the food always became smokier. The last ingredient we're going to add is our butter. This is about a cup of sweet butter. Traditionally, tamales have been made with uh, pork fat. We find that, uh, or lard, and by using butter, you can lighten the tamale up and it's more accessible. You can also use margarine or another type of fat. The more you whip the, the tamale dough, the more air you get and the lighter your tamale will be. The last ingredient is dried mushroom powder. We've taken our dried porcini or dried seps, and we've put them in a um, <clears throat> food uh, spice grinder, and then you create some dried mushroom powder in order to intensify the flavor of the wild mushroom flavor coming through the masa dough. You can either use this dry or rehydrate it with a little bit of water. Get the masa dough comes away from the sides of the bowl, it's done. You don't want to get it too wet and you don't want to get it too dry. It's going to be dry enough to hold the consistency but not too wet that it doesn't pull away from the sides of the bowl. That's the important trick here. Okay, let's look at our dough. So we, we've got it pulled away from the sides of the bowl. Now, the other important thing when you're making tamales is to check on the fat. And you make a little bit of a ball here, and you see how you, smat, you sort of put it against your hand, and if you get a light coating here of glistening, it means that you have enough moisture and enough fat in it. Otherwise, when you cook it, it'll be too dry. So you always take the tamale and, and you get a light. If it gets too oily, it should just be a light coat, and the dough should form in a wet ball and be very, very pliable. If it's, um, it's a little bit better to go to the other side of having a little bit more fat and moisture than being too dry because when you steam them, they'll be very dry and mealy. Okay, there we've got our dough. Now you can make this dough a day ahead of time, two days ahead of time, three days ahead of time. Three days is about maximum because it will ferment at you. If you make it ahead of time, uh, cover it in plastic wrap and keep it in the very cold part of the refrigerator. It doesn't freeze well, but you, it will refrigerate for two to three days. We we'll take our fresh morels. A variety of wild mushrooms comprise the filling some of our oyster mushrooms. Another favorite mushroom that I love to use is called hen of the woods. You want to get some nice meaty mushrooms. This is a wood's ear, sort of looks like a pig's ear or something, but it's called a wood's ear. And it has a sort of a gelatinous kind of quality. And if you, the mushrooms will have different flavor characteristics and also different textural characteristics. So I like to use mushrooms that, and also the colors are really pretty. Also, the chef will use portobello, chanterelle, black trumpet, and shiitake, but any variety available will work. I'm going to slice up a little bit of fresh garlic to add to them. French always have a saying that um, mushrooms without garlic is a little bit like a horse without a carriage without a horse. You want to get the garlic very finely minced because you don't want to have uh, you want to cook the garlic very quickly and you don't want to have large pieces of garlic floating around in the tamale because you want the 
mushrooms to be flavored by the garlic, you don't, you don't want to bite into a piece of garlic. Begin by sauteing the garlic in butter and olive oil. We're going to add our mushrooms. We're going to add the mushrooms before the garlic turns brown. A little bit of salt and pepper to our mushrooms. Salt will help bring out the some of the liquid. Also, as obviously as a flavoring, you don't need too much salt with mushrooms because they contain a large amount of natural MSG. A little bit more pepper. You could also add some fresh herbs to this, like a little bit of uh, parsley or cilantro or some chive. When it when it's sort of near finishing, you don't want to lose too much of the color or the flavoring of the herbs or the greenness. So you would add the fresh herbs at the end of the process. The mushrooms cook over medium heat for five to eight minutes. I'm going to add a little bit of water to help them stew. Next, Chef Miller stuffs the corn husks. And we're going to spread the tamale. Now you want to start about a third, about a fourth of the way down. And you don't, you want to leave about a half inch. And the idea here is to spread the dough out to a nice thin paste that you create a square or a rectangle inside the tamale husk or the dried corn husk. Now a lot of times people make their dough too thick and they don't get enough filling. And so what you're eating is a lot of masa rather than a, you know, a mushroom tamale. You can make barbecue tamales, you can make shrimp tamales, we've made lobster tamales. You can make a goat cheese and rajas, nice vegetarian tamales. Um, again, see how, and, the, and, all, and when you're working with the tamale dough, it shouldn't adhere to your hands. You should be able to work with it and press it in. Now, if you've got the ball refrigerated, take it out of the refrigerator about a half hour because you want the dough soft as you're working with the dough. The corn husks were soaked in water, making okay. them pliable. The coloring here, you notice it's a little bit darker. That comes from our wild mushroom powder. Um, you can add barbecue sauces. You can add mustards. You can add different kinds of hot sauces. I, I really find it's fun to flavor tamales. Now here you can see, see how thin we've, we've made our dough. We've made it approximately about a, less than a fourth of an inch. OK. Now we're going to put. This is sort of a tamale, tamale grande here, big fat tamale. We put our stuffing in the center. We want to use a lot of nice wild mushrooms. You see how that gives us the texture, the different colors, and we don't want to have little tiny pieces of mushroom. We want to have something that has a lot of, lot of body. So you want to have a sort of a generous tamale. You want to be skimpy. Okay. A lot of times you go to the grocery store and you buy those little. Texan tamales. This is a this is a New Mexican tamale. <laughs> okay, we're going to take one side of the masa dough and bring it over to the top, and we're going to create our seam. Bring the other side, and it, we're going to roll it a little thin. We're going to pull the tamale husk away. Bring the other side up. And using, don't use your fingers inside. Use the husk to, to take, to use the tamale. You don't have to touch the dough. Okay. Going to close the end here by pushing the outside and pinching it a little bit. Now at this point, we've got a little hole here. We're going to take a little bit of dough. Thin it out, and we're going to just put it there. And we're going to push down from the outside to give us so that it so that you have a nice thin casing around the tamale. Okay. So there we have the mush mushroom filling. It's closed at the top. Now, if you're using a wet uh, wet filling, it's more important that you close off the ends. This part is okay. There are different ways. Okay. So now we've got our tamale inside the husk. Now this is what we're doing to do it very, very simply. You could fold this over and you can steam it just like that. You can actually tie both ends and we would have moved our dough to the center. This one we're going to just, 
We're going to fold this side over and we're going to tie and twist one end and we're going to leave this end open. Tie the tamales with a strip of corn husk. Make a little bit of a bow. They are steamed for about 20 minutes. For our sauce for our tamales, we're going to make a roasted or blackened or dry roasted tomatillo sauce with smoked chilies. The tomatillo, a lot of people think, is the, uh, related to the tomato, but actually it's in the gooseberry family or the nightshade family. It has a nice flavor of the, uh, you can use it either raw or cooked, and the flavor of, of the tomatillo is nice and tart. It has sort of a green plum rhubarb flavor. It's a really nice thing to use. A lot of people don't know about the tomatillos. Dry roast the tomatillos for 20 minutes over high heat, turning every five minutes. Dry roasted garlic is also included in the sauce. This is much better in a blender rather than a food processor because I find that it's much easier to do and it gives us a better consistency. Let a little bit of garlic. There's a little too much garlic. And we're going to add our smoked chilies. Now these are chilies that were originally like large uh, called a wachananga or a very large size jalapeno and they turn red when they ripen and then they're smoked over mes their mesquite fires for about 72 hours or three days. So they have a very, very intense, smoky, hot flavor and it's a chipotle. It comes also in this form, you can buy it in a sauce that comes in a can called chipotle in adobo, which this is already mixed. That's this chili that's been pureed with a little bit of vinegar, tomato, onion, salt, and garlic. And you can find it in the Latino markets called chipotle unadobe. unadobe. We're going to add the uh, whole uh, chipotles. We're going to add two of these with the seeds. Leave the seeds in. You shouldn't actually need any extra water with this. Going to add a, a touch, just a touch of salt and a little touch of sugar to bring out some of the natural sweetness of the tomatillo. Just a tiny bit. Sort of like in the Chinese cooking where we add a little tiny bit of salt, a little sugar, to sort of round out the flavors in our mouth. Fresh cilantro leaves are the final flavoring. So we're going to put our cilantro. If you want to get don't, a little bit of the stem, or the smaller part of the stem is fine because it's going to blend, but you don't want your big stems. I'm going to put that right in. Now you put the cilantro in, making sure the tomatillos are cool. If the tomatillos are very hot, you, they're going to basically cook the cilantro, and you want to leave the green flavor and the texture of the cilantro in it. So leave your tomatillos after you ro dry roast them, let them get to room temperature or even cold. And we're just going to blend this part very, very shortly. You want to see all of these, the green specks in the sauce when you finish it. So there we have our roasted tomatillo, smoked chili, and cilantro sauce for our tamale. We're going to uh, serve this by peeling back. This is the top part, this is the bottom part of the tamale, this is the top. The bottom part is where our seam is, and we always want to go to the top. We're going to peel it back so that we can see. We're just going to create little strips here so that you can actually see the tamale itself. Now, so that you peel some for each end, and you can fold it under. And here we have the wild mushroom tamale. You can see that nice dark texture from our dried mushroom powder and you can see the corn and you can see a little bit of the mushroom sticking out of the end which gives it a nice appearance I think. This is our blackened tomatillo and smoked chili with cilantro. Finally some of the sauteed mushrooms. A little bit of the uh, portobello, a little bit of the black trumpets, some fresh chanterelle, And so, so we have our wild mushroom tamale with wild uh, mushroom dough. Puente de ocaso 
noche de luna, esta chavala es pura cuna, novia romántica como ninguna. <risa> 